you really can't mess it up. So you don't have to be concerned that you could screw it up. You know? Or people have said to me, what happens if I make it back to heaven and I screw it up again? You know, it's like, screwed it up in the first place. You can't, you can't screw it up again because you never screwed it up in the first place, you know. That's, that's how free we are. Really, free. The question, really just trying to make it simple, is, is where does the, the fact that it's not all real start and stop, as far as what he's saying in the, in the, in the car, I'd just like to know that if, if you're a surgeon and you were operating on me, and that if someone's driving along in front of me, that they're connected. That's all. That would be enough. They're connected. Well, the pilot that it's everything that's going to fly our planes, that they're actually think, well, today is a good day, and I'm not going to fly the plane that plane in the ground. And, you know, might not make a difference well, if you're on board. That will be the end of, of this experience. But, but there is still a, a degree of practicality that has to be, has to be observed. We, we don't know if, if have to be is the right word, but, uh, but that is being observed. And the insanity of, of, of what's happening here is just so, so clear. You know, and like people punch, punching each other in the face, and a spiritual retreat is just like, that's completely insane. So, what thought system would do that? They did that on the supposed shrine of Jesus, too. Punch yeah. each other in the face. But it's still, when you take a car in the, on the road, you don't drive down the road, wondering if the guy, each, each, each person that crosses in front of you, uh, is going to drive into you and trust. Yeah, in the end, it's just like I said with relationship, that relationship has been called mysterious. You know, a lot of people I know that will say, the more I, I look at and examine and explore and go into the topic of relationship, the more mysterious it gets. Uh, it doesn't get clearer, they'll tell me. It gets more mysterious. Like, it's something super mysterious. And I would say it's the same with this world, that where does all this lead? Where is it all heading? You know, I mean really, let's just take the topic of practicality. If somebody asks me, and let's leave heaven out of this, let's leave heaven and nirvana because that's just purely abstract. Nobody has seen the Holy Spirit, perceived the Holy Spirit, nobody has seen God. And when you talk about heaven, you can talk about happiness and joy and oneness, but for most, we could say, people in the world, they've come to a state of, okay, that's still speculation. It sounds kind of good, eternity, eternal happiness and joy, but let's be real here. Let's talk about practicalities. But what if I said that the most practical experience you could have that still relates to this world, that still relates to this world, I'm not talking about abstraction, but the most practical experience you could have that still relates to this world is simply to see everything as symbolic. When you read a fairy tale and you, you kind of go, okay, what's the punchline? What's, what's the point of the fairy tale? There, you only want to have a point, you know. Even with uh, Goldilocks, uh, even with Cinderella or Peter Pan or or Pocahontas, or on and on and on. You know, we like our stories, but we like to have there to be a point. And what if I told you that the point was to see the world as completely symbolic, like a fairy tale? In other words, what happens is the mind is in the bad habit, the ego habit of dividing the world up. You know, if I was saying it's all symbolic, then I would say, if you can see it that way, it will bring you peace. But as long as you keep dividing the world up into the good illusions and the bad illusions, or the real ones and the unreal ones. I mean, if you go into a, a bookstore and you walk through the categories, I'll guarantee you there's different ones, but a couple of the categories are fiction and non-fiction. 
and I say, what makes you think you can tell the difference between fiction and non-fiction? When you talk about dreams at night, you know, and you say, oh my God, I had a nightmare last night. It was, it was really crazy and it was uh, disorienting and it was frightening and this and this, but thank God it was just a dream. What makes you think that the daytime experience is any different from those dreams at night? You still have the reactions at the dreams at night, you know, you still have the, if you're getting chased in the nighttime dream, you still have the pounding heart like you have in the daytime dream. And, and I've watched that, I mean, I, I use that example a lot where I have a friend, Jimmy Twyman, who, who uh, wrote a book about the silent brotherhood and over in Kosovo and, and so on and so forth. And, and he, he did his book and then at some point after that a controversy arose was, you know, did he just make the whole book up, you know, about the Silent Brotherhood and his experiences over in Europe and meeting them and them sitting in silence to save the world and everything, or was, that, was he just making it up? Marla Morgan did that with her book Mutant Message Down Under. She went down, walk about on with the Aborigines, came back to the United States, started going to the churches, and started presenting it in workshops, and then this huge controversy arose. Did she just make this whole thing up about going down to out the outback in Australia and make up the whole story, which was kind of a dramatic story about tele, tele, tele telepathy, about letting go of everything that you believe and all self-concepts and images and having no secrets. That's what the Aborigines were teaching her. And now with Gary Renard, another friend of mine who writes a book, and Disappearance of the Universe, does another one, has got a third one on the way, and there was a big Course in Miracles controversy saying, some people coming out, well-respected so-called teachers saying he's a big liar, uh, he did not really have Ascended Masters coming to sit on his couch in Maine. He made the whole thing up, da-da-da-da-da. What, what I'm just saying to everybody is, are you willing to open up to the experience that all of it is fiction? And what if that's the most practical thing? In other words, instead of thinking, okay, I've got a doctor here, or I've got a surgeon, and I hope they're competent and they know what they're doing, or I have a, I'm taking a plane flight and I hope that pilot is, is competent, is well trained and is of good state of mind, that's still putting it out there as if these are characters that are real, that you're in a real situation with real characters and you're concerned about the motives of these, these other characters. Do they mean me well or are they bizarre, are they going to freak out on me and might I die? But that I that, that would ask the question, that I that's concerned, you know, that the surgeon's competent, that the pilot's competent, that they didn't put poison in my food. <laughs> we had, one night we were here and they are like, they're joking about putting poison in my food. <laughs> and I just gave Christian a big hug because it's like, it's symbols. These are symbols. <laughs> Poison is funny in a fairy tale. It's not funny in, in if you believe it's it's real. It's that's not a funny thought. That's what they call sick humor. <laughs> Talk to Lena. She brought rat poison. It's kind of like dark, <laughs> dark humor, <laughs> really dark. And so, and you know, they make movies about dark humor and this and this, but. But what I'm just saying is, if you go deeper with Jesus and you keep following him all the way down, or with Dr. Hugh Lynn or anyone who's, who's doing this, you will have to get down to a point where you have to entertain the idea that, that if, if it's all fiction, if it's all symbols, that you're safe. <laughs>